If you have your Bibles, we got to ask you to turn to Genesis 25. Genesis 25. Uh, while you're turning there, uh, uh, continue to remember all of our missionaries when you think to pray. And I mentioned uh, Brother Katrine last Wednesday night, and I still haven't heard anything uh, as far as an update. So I think of something bad it happened uh, that the missionary would have put it up there so I haven't seen anything but you continue to remember him uh, when you think to pray. Genesis 25 and we're going to begin reading in verse 27. Genesis 25 beginning in verse 27 the Bible says and the boys grew and Esau was a cunning hunter and a man of the field. And Jacob was a plain man, dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison, but Rebekah loved Jacob. And Jacob sawed pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that, with that same red pottage, for I am faint, therefore his name was called Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die, and what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he swore unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. I'd like to preach this morning, the Lord be my helper, what hunger will make you do. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your blessed word. Lord, we thank you for each and every one that's here this morning. According to your word, Lord, we understand and know that they're here by divine appointment, that they're not hearing these things by chance, but they're hearing uh, by your goodness and your glory. Lord, we pray for the lost. God, that you might save them today, and we that are saved, Lord, that we might be closer to you and that you would help us to put away and put aside things that hinder. We pray these things in the sweet and the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Now, maybe some somewhat familiar verses of Scripture. I've heard a few sermons on it, but not exactly the way uh, I am looking at the Scripture this morning because we find that Esau does something that being hungry makes you do. Now, everyone in the sound of my voice at least had been a little bit hungry physically, and I'd say more often than that, we've been hunger spiritually, whether we knew it or not. You know, this is a sad thing. When we're hungry physically, we know it. When we're hungry spiritually, we don't always know it. Now, uh, a lot of stuff that we identify in the United States as hunger is not. Now, uh, until you went three or four days without eating, you don't know what hunger is. Uh, back when I was a kid, I uh, guess in eighth grade or maybe ninth grade, y'all remember Hands Across America, or four of us remember Hands Across America. Uh, me and my friend Lynn, Lynn went down there and, and stood in line, and it was to bring attention to hunger in Ethiopia. And one thing that got my attention in that time is I remember they had gotten some trucks down there and they were starting to feed and uh, uh, some flour, a flour sack busted and there were people literally eating uh, raw flour, just eating it off the ground. Now, that's hunger. That's something, and we all know, you know, or we all prefer, uh, you know, uh, flour is... Uh, better if it's made into a biscuit or into some bread or, you know, something nice, dumplings or something that's good to eat. But we've never been in a situation 
we were that hungry where flour looks good by itself. And that was the situation then, and I, I dare say many times in the modern day, that's where we're at spiritually, that we, we take whatever's there. You know, the other day, and, and you know, it, it, I just had to shake my head and walk away, and uh, because they set up this little room at work, and I went in there, and uh, I, I was looking at it, what are y'all doing? Now, there was a lava lamp in there as tall as me. I'm not making that up. And I was like, what is this? I said, it looks like where people smoke pot. Well, this is our spiritual room. And I was like, I was like, y'all got to be kidding me. I said, well, it's to, for you to meditate. And I said, we're in Erin. <laughs> you know, this is Erin, Tennessee. I was like, and I just couldn't believe it. But then I, after I walked away, shaking my head, I thought, people are so hungry, just like eating raw flour, they will eat that. They, they will go to that. They, that will uh, click with some people. And we see the situation uh, is desperate, and uh, people are made in different ways. <laughs> Uh, so we'll go back to verse 27. And the boys grew, meaning Esau and Jacob. And Esau was a cunning hunter and a man of the field. And Jacob was a plain man, not plain like an everyday man, but a farmer, a plain man dwelling in tents. Now this is the thing, whether you want to be one or the other, it really doesn't matter. But now this is what you can do unless the weather is really bad. You can depend on the guard. Now, hunting is two things. It depends on your skills, and it depends if you find it. Now, a lot of people are very skilled hunters, but the problem is, is they never find it. Now, uh, the deer at our place are very, very smart deer, and right now you can see them. Literally, I count in the back pasture one day, 12 deers. Now, when season opens... You won't see them no more. I, I think they go by the store and read when the season opens and they go hide until it's off again in December because then you can't find them. And I, I remember Matthew getting very, very frustrated. And uh, I said, well, Matthew, did you tell him when the season opened? And he didn't think it was very funny. Uh, and uh, so what did it depend on? It, it just depends <laughs> On the goodness of God and sometimes you're going to get it and sometimes you're not now unfortunately Esau had an off day he had a day where he didn't find anything and it makes you wonder if he looked more than one day in other words this hunting expedition took longer than just a routine day because, you know, what I found was a lot of hunters don't stay out because they don't want to come home empty-handed. It's almost a prideful thing. They don't want to be found with that they didn't get nothing for that day, so they'll stay and stay. And then, again, we find this was centuries ago, and, and maybe he even stayed longer. Uh, you know, a lot of people criticize his fatigue, but this is the reality. We don't know how long he was out there. Uh, the Bible does not tell us that. And, and we all know at times we get hungry, and hungry makes you do foolish things. And uh, the boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter, and a, man of the, uh, and a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in, tenant, in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison, but Rebekah loved Jacob. And Jacob sawed pottage. Now, that uh, meal, I've heard it described very different ways by different people, and I really don't know what it was. But my best understanding is this. It's like a cornmeal and water. Uh, it, and then some people say it's like beans. I've heard, I've heard both stories and Honestly, I can't tell you which is right, but very singular. Remember when Daniel wanted a, a specific diet for him and Jacob and, I mean, him and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, something like that, a very plain, routine diet that you get out of the field. 
Now, that's not really remarkable as far as food. Now, I love beans. I love about any beans that you can fix. They're good to me. But you know what? You can get burned out on them, right? You can get it kind of sick. Like, I would rather have something besides this. But you know what the good thing about beans is? They're always there. Now, me and Donna, Donna recently, uh, uh, we've been getting things kind of by the volume, and in our in our closet, there's these huge five-gallon buckets, and there's one of them full of beans, and it's all you know. And she'll take a few out, and she'll she'll cook them and put them back and can them. Uh, so she can use them quickly. But if we needed to, we could go in there and make a bunch of beans of what is out there. Now, this is the thing. Uh, they're there as long as they'll stay. And what I have found with dried beans, they last a long, long, long time. So why it was a boring meal, and why, because he was a cunning hunter, huh, Isaac loved Jake, I mean Esau, what we found with Jacob, it was steady. Now, which would you prefer to have? A steady diet or a diet that just blows you away? Now, a lot of us would like the diet that blows us away, right? Steak and pork chops and all that good stuff. Now, when we think about that, the difference is in the United States, all that is domesticated. And we can buy it. We don't have to chase it down. We don't have to run it with a bow and arrow. We can go down at Frank's and get whatever we want. Right? But that was not true then. So which was the better diet? Which was what? Uh, which would be the one that's most appealing? So we find really two things. A man that chose a steady, boring diet, and we find a man that took his chances, if you will, on a, on a diet that was, that was very, very delicious, but it was circumstance, if there is such a thing, that give it to him. So we see that he has a bad run, Verse 29, and Jacob sawed pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with, uh, with thy same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore his name, uh, therefore was his name called Edom, or red. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. Now, I want you to see uh, Esau finds himself in a desperate situation. Now, under, uh, uh, and I still think to some extent, and I used to pre preach very frequently about the value, how little value that Esau must have placed in this wonderful thing of being the birth heir. But as the years go by, I also see he was desperate. He was desperate. He was starving to death. Now, I have, a, or I had, four, uh, three brothers, one full brother, two half-brothers, and me and my half-brothers, we made the best out of a bad situation, but I'll be honest, I didn't like either one of them. But you know, if Tom or Billy came to my house and said, I'm hungry, I would not turn them away. But they were still living and they wanted something to eat. I said, sit down and we'll find you something to eat. That, that's just natural love. Even if I, it was people that were not kin to me, I would give them something to eat. I've told you this many times. My grandmother would not turn anybody away. And I, I've seen her make them eat on the front porch, but she would bring them something. And, and, and so we find then that when you're desperate... You will eat just about anything. Now, I like everything except for beets. Beets make me sick. Beets taste like dirt. They, they are just not my thing. But you know what? I bet if I went three or four days, beets would start looking pretty good to me. You see what I'm saying? Hunger will make you do 
irrational things. Now, what we identify with hunger and what really hunger is is two different things because we don't understand hunger in, in a wealthy nation like ours. But I will say this, we are spiritually starving to death. Right. Our nation as a whole, and blessed be God, we have a decent, we decent good church. We have a lot of churches to fellowship with. But listen, on the general... Our nation is at the end. Our nation is starving to death. You know why we have gender identity? Because spiritually, there's nothing to eat in our land. People are afraid to say, hey, that's sinful. That's wrong. Let me show you in the Bible. Therefore, people are starving to death. There, 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 there's no sustenance that remains. And then you have this flip side, like I said, that weird room that's set up at work. And uh, you know what that is? That's an empty steak. <laughs> that, that, that's cotton candy from down at the fair. You see what I'm saying? It looks great, but there's nothing there. That, that's where we've arrived. That, that, that's the natural new spiritual diet. Dear friend of mine, he and I was talking the other day, just a kid, I like him, he's younger than all my children except for Bella, and uh, we were talking, and he's leaving this group to say church would be would be uh, gratuitous to the people that where he goes. I do not feel like it's a church, but uh, at the same time, he's leaving that group, and he's going somewhere else, and of course, I invited him here, and he says, well, we're looking something modern. You know what that means? It means they're hungry. I, I, I didn't get mad at him. Like I said, he's a good kid. And me and him get to talk a lot. But what he was really telling me is I'm spiritually starving. So if you're spiritually starving, where do you go to eat? First of all, you have to recognize it, do you know? If you don't know, what you're, if, you don't know if you're starving, you don't know what to do. Now, I, I've known people in a health sense, their natural appetite has gone away, sometimes by, because of age, sometimes because of disease, and they truly don't know that they're hungry. Now, I feel like we, believe, we live in a day and age today where that is very much where we're at. Go with me to the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. Uh, very familiar verses of Scripture. Luke 15, and we'll begin reading in verse 13. Luke 15 and verse 13. The Bible says, And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there he wasted his substance with riotous living. Now, I want you to remind you this was the story of, uh, of the young man that went to his father and said, Lord, uh, Dad, give me your inheritance. I want to I wanna leave. Give me what's due me, and I'm going to get out of here. Now, there's a lot of what is said just in that, but probably the most one, in addition to having no respect for his father, in addition to that, is that he was hungry. He, he was looking for something. You know, uh, when, in, in the modern day, when you see people that are just never satisfied, you, you see them, uh, Sarah's fixing to go back to school, large university this time, you, you're going to see a lot of people that are not satisfied. And the reason why, they're hungry. Now, they think education is going to satisfy them. They think that making money is going to satisfy them. But that spiritual appetite cannot be filled with carnal things. So this boy, thinking that, oh, I know how to get to feeling good. Uh, Daddy, give me my inheritance, and, and you, you won't see me no more. I'm out of here. So uh, his father being a very wise father, the way I look at it, did it. Now, it'd be the tendency of the flesh to say, you know what, I still got a pulse the last time I checked, you can wait till I die, <laughs> right? But no, th this, 
this father understood and wanted, wanted his son to gain something from this. And so he did it. Verse 14. And when he, meaning the uh, son, the one that had inherited, and when he had spent all that he had, uh, excuse me, and when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Now, uh, when we get to be in want, is it the first thing for you to go to the Lord? I dare say no for most of us. You know, I get to be in one, I, you know, start Googling and see if I can find a nursing job that pays a little bit more than the one I've got right now, right? That's how Larry satisfies things. That's, that's, that's my method to solve problems, right? And this old boy, we're going to find that he solves his problems the same way. He finds him a job. Now, nothing wrong with that, right? But not a lot of jobs to be had in the Great Depression, right? I know Mama told me one time, she said, when all her coaches from Granite City started coming back down here when the steel mills closed and they all went back to Grandma's farm. Uh, that her and Patsy didn't even know what they were talking about. They was like, well, what's a depression? Because they lived on the farm. They, they had the same food they always had. And her cousins were excited about seeing so much food around. Uh, in other words, they went back to the basics. But now this boy, in, I want you to say this again, it's what would be in the United States com economy as a depression, all the money's gone, he began to be in want. You know where the United States is right now? It's in a spiritual depression. Probably the worst ever. Mm -hmm. Now, all of us that are uh, studied our history, and thank God my kids got a real history lesson, the depression, the Great Depression from 29 to really 1941, uh, in those years of the Depression, um, people were in want. Right. Now, here in the hills of Stewart County, you know, our people made it better than most. I remember Mama saying, well, we had plenty to eat always, but I didn't always have a new pair of shoes. Right. In fact, she said, Patsy and I went without shoes in the summer so we could save them for the winter. You see what I'm saying? And, and, and so we, we see then that kind of want we understand, but the spiritual kind of want is the same thing. There's no food out there. And, and what food out there is out there is not beneficial. Now, when you look at things from a nutritional standpoint, and I think this is literally the only class Don and I had together in four years of college, we had a nutrition class together. And uh, actually, I don't remember. I did good in there. That's all I can remember, but I don't remember a thing about it. Uh, but you see, uh, I do remember some things from nutrition in nursing school, and that's you got to have a balanced diet. You gotta have a certain amount of protein, whether it's meat protein or not. Some protein, some fruits, some vegetables, and they all mix together to nourish you. Now, if you're missing one, say you don't have meat, or a complex protein is what it's called, all these aren't gonna do you any good. Now, what do we live in today? We live in a spiritual land where they tickle your emotions. Where, where they give you six foot tall long events. Where they have a laser light show like from the 80s rock concerts. They give you something to stimulate the flesh, but when you get home, you realize you're still hungry. Yeah. You know, as much as we eat here for lunch <coughs> on the Lord's Day, about five o'clock, 
I get to scourge into the kitchen. <laughs> it's irritating to Don. And sometimes me and the girls just leave and, and go get us something. But um, hunger's going to come back. You ever think about that? Yeah. You'll satisfy it for a while. And that's what these popped up churches do today. They're like, they're like an ice cream, like a, like a sundae. And they have the cherries and the pecans and, and the whipped cream and the ice cream. But it's going very, very quick. Now, if you don't get anything out of this, you'll remember this. The nutrient that our body absorbs the quickest is carbohydrates or sugars. And they're gone very quickly. The new world religion is carbohydrates. No protein. No sustenance. Nothing that's going to keep you going very long. And that's exactly what this old boy found out. And you know, he got down to the husk. <laughs> and he was down with the pigs that he was eating. And think about the corn husk. It never says that he ate any. He might have. It actually says, he says, huh, what servants have more in despair in my father's house? And, and he left. But you know what? Have you ever thought about eating a corn husk? I never have. I, I thought it would be very strange. But I do know this about them. There's no nutrition in there. There isn't. He's like, well, how do the, how do the cows get by with it? They have four stomachs and we have one. That, that's why it works for them. So even if, you know what? You think about this morning all across our land. How many people are getting into all that and they have no spiritual spiritual nourishment? And they get home and they wonder why they're hungry. You know what people do when they're spiritually hungry? They feed themselves with other things. Entertainment. And, and I'm one of the world's worst, but you know what? You, you get surprised sometimes. Why does somebody sit around and watch TV all the time? It's because they're hungry. Why, 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 do, why do people begin to drink and, and, and try to fulfill themselves that way? It's because they're spiritually hungry. Why, why do they do dope? The very same reason. They're spiritually hungry. It's a strange food that lasts for a little while. But you know, with drinking and drugs, just like with chocolate cake, you want more chocolate cake with extra ice and next time, you always have to up the ante. Now, so we find that, and, and we know that the, the that he went back home, and, and, and his daddy met him, on, met him along the way, and hugged him, and re welcomed him home, and he received his son's ring again, and they were able to restore their relationship. So I ask you, and I'm going to read a couple other things. Are you spiritually hungry this morning? Now, part of that is a good thing. It's like I said, when you quit being hungry physically, your health is already in trouble. Sure. Hunger is a good thing. It, it, means you're, it means you're normal. It means you're healthy. So, spiritually wise, did you come here and anticipate some stuff? Now, because it's our anniversary or we're celebrating it today, I know exactly what we're having for lunch downstairs. And, and I like all of it. Something to anticipate. You can't beat Rick's barbecue. You just, you just can't beat it. All right? At least that's what Stuart Kellyans believe. And, uh, but did you come here with the same anticipation that we were going to get into that book and be fed? That we were, you, you know what the premise behind fasting is? And fasting is a New Testament teaching. It's so you'll get your priorities straight. And maybe, just maybe, you'll understand one hunger from the other. You see what I'm saying? 
We, we, we need that. So how are you going to fulfill it? Are you going to go to one of these crazy things and uh, eat chocolate donuts and, and, and run around the room and scream and holler and watch the lights flip about you and, and all that that gives you no sustenance? Or are you going to go somewhere or have an oatmeal for the 486th time? <laughs> right? Which one is going to last you longer? It's the brown beans that we gain from this scripture that, that tells us everything that we ever needed to know. Is that going to be sustaining for you? And let me tell you this, friend, if you really want to hiss, yes it is. Maybe it gets boring. Maybe it gets difficult. But you know what? You'll wake up in distress one day and you'll remember, hey, Brother Larry said God's still on the throne. Not only is this thing okay, but the God of all heaven ordained it for my good. See, they don't teach that in other places. If you don't have a pocket full of money, you did something wrong. I'm not going to tell you that because my pocket's not full either. <laughs> You see what I'm saying? So, what do we have to be happy about? What, what are we giving glory to God about this morning? Are you being fed? Now I'm going to go to Acts. Acts 17. Now, uh, Acts 17, Paul's message on Mars Hill. Acts 17 and verse 23. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, that means being devoted to these people often, are, are these statues often, and even still today, many cultures put food before them. They prepare them expensive meals and lay it before the idol. I found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore you intimately worship him, him do I declare unto you. Now, once you see all along Mars Hill, and my best understanding is many of them are still there today, was some empty eating. Now, I've seen a lot in 55 years, but I've never seen a rock eat. I've never seen a statue eat. So why would you prepare a rock, a meal? Because they're hungry. They, they want to be validated. You, you know what the good thing about a meal is? It's the fellowship. It's as good as the food, right? It's the fellowship. What are they really wanting? They're wanting fellowship in, in a higher place. They just don't know. They don't know the true God. They, they don't know who he is. And, and so he, Paul says, this is the one you're talking about. The, the, the unknown God. The one you don't know. The one that you've never served. Verse 24. God has made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, d <laughs> dwelleth not in temples made by hand. That's the God of the Bible. Today, you're going to see a lot of people, and you know when I say that, it's not the same lot of people it was when I was a boy. When I was a kid, everybody went to church. Everybody I knew of then. But you know when I got to high school, I met a lot of kids that said, well, we really don't go to church. And I thought that was the oddest thing. I had never heard of that before. Uh, I, I thought that to be a very strange thing. But now, it's almost strange if you do go. We, we've kind of switched places, haven't we? And, uh, and, and, and so we find that as Paul was sitting here, the reason they were doing these crazy things to the statutes, the statues, they wanted... To fellowship. They had a hunger. They had a spiritual craving, and they didn't even know what it was. 
Last place I'm going to read in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 1, we know the church at Rome had horrible, horrible problems. Most of them were probably never rectified. The church probably did fall into what is known as Roman Catholicism today. And Paul had those same concerns in the first chapter. But we're just going to read one verse. In verse 20, the Bible says this, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. And look, look out, and there's no denying God. Many, many years ago, I think Sarah was only 12 or 14, uh, she and I, across the hill, it's owned by somebody now, but there was this huge hill completely dozed out. Uh, I guess the uh, Swifts on it, they bought it and started harvesting uh, red clay dirt there. But back then, you could go all the way to the top of it. And so one evening, it was such a, it was cold, but it was the most beautiful, clear evening. You could see every star in the sky. Snow on the ground, it was just beautiful. So we climbed that big hill to the top just to get the view. And just like Abraham looked upon the sky, I mean, just millions, countless numbers of stars declaring, I am God. I have created all this. All this you see belongs to me. It's mine. I created it. It belongs to me. And so we are without excuse. Those of you that say you don't believe in God, you are without excuse. There, there, there's no denying whom he is. Being understood by the things that are made. The rocks, the hills, the mountains, the seas. You know there's a God. Even his eternal power in Godhead. So, they are without excuse. You remember when the Lord gives us that parable. It was a great wedding feast. And the Bible says this. And they began to make excuse. I've just bought some, I've just bought a team of horses. I've got to go try them. Well, I don't know about y'all, but if I was going to buy a team of horses, I'd try them before I bought them, right? See, the old adage, any excuse is better than none, is not true. God declares himself every day that we live. Every moment of every day, he is God. Do you worship him? He take time to lift up his name? And I'm not just talking about coming to the house of God. I, that, that's a piece of it. But worship happens every day, not just at the Lord's house. In, in the life of a true believer, it should, it should be something you do instinctively. You know, that's why I've never been too stressed about people who won't attend church, that leave the church, because their instincts are off. Now, I'm not a mean man, but if somebody tried to hit my daughter, my instincts are going to kick in. You see what I'm saying? And in the same way, a believer's instinct should be naturally to be down at the house of God on the Lord's Day. And if they leave, let them leave. Right? But you know what? In the modern day, that's not the adage at all. If they leave, let's turn up the volume. Let's put a more, few more strobes out and we'll keep them. So how are you being nourish, nourished? How, how, do you, how do you feel? I, I hate that word sometimes, but it's what I mean. What do you perceive as your closeness to the Lord this morning? Are you close to Him? Is there something hindering you? Do you love His Word? We need to be close.